name's James Brown, a uh, professional opportunist. I'm a magician, pickpocket and hypnotist. Uh, unlike the rest of the guys you've seen here today, I'm not a therapist. Um, interesting that you talked about this idea of frames and how people perceive something. One of the things that I did in the last couple of years is I changed who I was from being a, seen as a magician to being a professional opportunist. I started to recognise, in fact, I've always recognised limitations. One thing I will say is a kind of a slight, you know, oh, by the way, I'm going to agree with everything that's been said so far. I just might agree with it from a different direction. Um, so it might appear that I disagree, but I don't. I kind of, I really loved what I've heard, but because of, uh, of my knowledge of, of, of being a magician, I have a slightly different viewpoint around certain things. And, and I want to start off with this. My, my grandma, who's, who's uh, sadly departed now, was about this big and about this wide. She was a Yorkshireman in the fullest definition. Now, some of you may not get what I mean by a Yorkshirewoman, but uh, some of you do. Not, put your hands up if you know what I mean by a Yorkshirewoman. Yeah, this, this is typified by the kind of stout, no-nonsense, says what she means, means what she says, doesn't mess about in any way. Basically, what it means is that she had no part of her brain that managed to filter what she said in front of other people. <laughs> she spoke her mind. But within that, there were some real kind of gems. There were some real lovely things that she would say to me. And one of them was this. And it became something that genuinely changed how I viewed everything. And it was, life is simple, we complicate it. Life is simple, we complicate it. And it's something that I've held to ever since I heard her say that when I was a kid. And it's made a difference on everything I do. Give you an example. Ravi here knows me um, as a, initially as a magician and as a pickpocket. And I'm, within the world of magic, I'm fairly well known as a pickpocket. And people often ask me, why is it that you, that you seem to be able to do things as a pickpocket that, that a lot of pickpockets struggle with? Like I will steal Rolex-style watches, the kind that Freddie's got here. Um, notice I said Rolex style, I wasn't assuming it's a real one. <laughs> uh, stealing ties as well, but I don't have a problem with it. And it took me quite a while to work out what it was that, that kind of made a difference. And, and I realised what it was. It's really simple. I hadn't accepted the belief that it was difficult. About ten years ago, I met a guy called Gary Jones who some of you will know is, is a magician. I think he's brilliant. He's a really good friend of mine. I saw Gary steal a watch at a magic convention, a gathering of, of magicians. And, and I'd never seen it done before. I was aware of pickpocketing, but I had the same awareness that your average person on the street has. It was associated with crime. And I saw this guy very elegantly remove somebody's wristwatch without them knowing, and then reveal it in some way to an amazing reaction. I thought, I've got to ask him. I said, Gary, how, how did you do that? And Gary went, oh, I just took it off his wrist. And there was a group of us listening. And all but one person in that group responded by going, no, and walking away. The one person who responded differently was me. Because I went, yeah, you're right. That is exactly what you've just done. You haven't lied to me. You haven't covered up. You haven't hidden any truth from me. What you did is you just took it off. And I went out and I did it. About 10 minutes later, just walked up to somebody and thought, right, if I just make sure your attention is controlled, I will just take it off you the same way that I would remove my own watch from myself. I had no technique, no master plan as such. I just physically took the guy's watch off, but I made sure that his attention was fixated somewhere else. He was motivated to think in another direction. And because nobody told me that one watch was harder to steal than another, I just started to steal other watches. Not in a kleptomania kind of way. I want to point out, I did give them back. <laughs> well, I had to after being caught a few times. But anyway, um, because nobody told me that it was a difficult thing to do, I didn't have that mindset. So I was then stealing Rolex watches and any other kind. And it wasn't until a year or two down the line that somebody said, oh, I just saw you st steal that guy's you know, Rolex-style watch. That was incredible. Like, they're really hard to do. Do you know what happened then? <laughs> yeah, I believed it for a while. And I struggled. And I went from being really good at stealing watches 
to having a period of time when it just didn't, I just kept getting caught. Cool. And after a while, I realized why. And I thought, you know what? I think I need to change how I feel. And I did. So I want to start off with this. My, my innings into, into magic, if you like, my beginnings, rather, into, into, uh, into magic, was I saw a magician do a trick. And I, and I just worked it out, and I went off and I played. And I became very interested in how magic worked. It, it, sorry, why magic worked would be better than how. Why magic worked? <coughs> what was it about magic that, 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 that elicited a response from people? And I did magic for many years. It, it turned out I was different to a lot of magicians because I hadn't gone through the learning process that they had. They'd come into magic, and a lot of them had gone to a magic club, and they'd learned from other magicians in a magic club. And they'd bought tricks from shops, and they'd read the books given to them by magic dealers um, and, and fellow magicians. And, and they all came out into the world of magic, and they were doing essentially the same thing the same way and getting the same responses. Because I didn't have that background, and I came in from another angle, I looked at magic in a different way. And that different way allowed me to work on what magic was really about. And it, and it came down to this. Magic only exists if there is an end user that goes, wow. Magic only exists if somebody on the receiving end of it responds. And if a person responds to magic by going, oh, that's clever. Oh, well done. How did you do that? That's, that's interesting. I realized that that was a logical response. That was a left brainer. That was somebody who was analyzing. And, and there were people that do that. And then there were other people that you would do the simplest of effects to. And they would go, ah, and run away. <laughs> And I suddenly realized, hang on a minute, what I'm actually watching here, what I'm seeing, is trance. And this is what I want to get onto. I have a ludicrously simple definition of hypnosis. Now, I know there's some very learned people, people who have been doing hypnosis for a long <coughs> time in this room, people who know a massive amount of the subject and have read lots and lots of things. <coughs> but the reason why, as Ant mentioned, I, I jumped onto the hypnosis bandwagon and I just really loved it and had a great amount of success, I mean, a phenomenal amount of success for somebody who's been doing it as little time as I have, is because I don't have any fears and anxieties and problems that I associate with it. I not mentioned the fact that I, I didn't get amnesia, I went straight back in, because I came from a magic world. Not the magic world, I came from my magic world, yeah? And my magic world says that there's no failure. My brother, I'm, I'm, by the way, my wife is expecting, we've got a 14-year-old boy, who is nearly 14, but my wife's expecting again, so we're kind of really excited at the moment about all this process starting afresh, you know? Um, I, I'm not talking about, you know, you know oh, what can we mould this child into necessarily, but just knowing that we can, we can begin again, there's, there's a fresh canvas to, to, to nurture and work with. And one of the things I'm looking forward to is, is the moment where my child falls over for the first time. Now, there's a reason for this. Put your hand up as a parent in the room who has children. Yeah? Okay, now put your hand up. Keep your hands up, please. If you haven't got your hand up, put your hand up now who knows and has spent time with small children. Okay, it's pretty much all of us, isn't it? I think that is all of us. Wonderful. So you're, you're aware... Thanks, Mike. <laughs> so you're all aware that when a child, a little child, falls over for the first time, it has no frame of reference. Oh, by the way, little, I'm not NLP trained and hypnotically trained, by the way. I'm going to be honest with you. I've got no formal training in the subject whatsoever. I, I don't need it because I just do it. Right? And as arrogant as that might seem, you know, I want to get across to you. I think there are, there are levels of theory in what we do, and there are levels of practice in what we do. And my feeling has always been, I'd be aiming in that direction if I were you. Yeah because you'll get a lot more done. But I don't necessarily have the right terminology. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. But a child that falls down doesn't, ne doesn't have a frame of reference for that. And because it has no frame of reference, it already knows, because it's already <coughs> learned, that there are these things around it that give it some wonderful insights and frames of reference. They're called parents. So when little Billy falls over for the first time, Billy goes, at nearest parent. And if nearest parent goes, hey, up you get Billy, Billy goes, ha! and carries on playing. If parent, on the other hand, goes, oh, oh, Billy, what have you done? Billy goes, Wah! Yeah? You understand why? You get that, yes? All right? 
I don't think that changes when you grow up. I don't think that ever makes a difference in, in, in the sense of, I don't think that ever changes in your life. When I perform magic to somebody, and anybody here that is a performer that gets on stage, that does anything in this environment, when something doesn't go the way that the person expects it to go, they don't react. They look at you first. You make a mistake as a magician, you drop a pack of cards, and everybody goes at you, straight away. They look straight at you, and then they react. And their reaction is based on previous experience that they've had with that situation, but more importantly, the previous experience you've had with that situation and how you respond and react. Because when they look at you and they see a mistake, because you go, oh, I've made a mistake. Now they know you've made a mistake, so they'll react to it. The reaction might be they become very sympathetic towards you. And as somebody who stands on a stage a lot of the time, sympathy from your audience is not the good way to go. <laughs> really it isn't, yeah? You know? You might in your general everyday life enjoy a bit of sympathy now and again when something doesn't go right. But when you're stood on a stage looking at an audience of people, they all look at you and go, ah, <laughs> yeah, that's not good. I wouldn't advise that. The alternative response that people will likely give you it's an aggressive one. And the aggressive one is, you're shy. Yeah. Or verbalised however they want to. But it will be that way. However, in the moment where you do something wrong, you draw no frame to that whatsoever. People don't know, forget instantly. Yeah? If I'm doing a, 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 an act of some description and I drop a coin, if I go, <laughs> You know, you'll respond and react. You know I've made a mistake. If I drop a coin and just continue fluidly to the next stage, you will be aware the coin fell, but very quickly your mind will continue on the new pathway of what you're experiencing, and you will forget because there has been no frame of reference for that moment of failure. Now, something I say to magicians, my pet hate, is when a magician frames failure. So you see a magician drop a coin, and then he'll slightly nervously go, oh, you should have seen me practicing and everybody titters. What they've just done is put a big neon frame around the failure, and everybody remembers. But by just moving on, people forget, people don't notice. The same thing, I took all of that concept and that thinking and that way of behaving, and I brought it into hypnosis, because I recognized that hypnosis and magic and pickpocketing are the same thing. They have the same fundamental rules. And the fundamental rule to me is this, and this is essentially my definition of hypnosis, and it's mega simple. In the same way that, by the way, I know it's not this simplistic, because I have a medical background, but essentially your brain is split into two hemispheres. Forget functions and stuff at the moment necessarily, but one side of, of the brain specifically deals with logic. To argue, you know, arguably, it's, it's rational, it's functional, it's linear, it, it does the processes. And the other side of your brain deals with creative stuff. Colour, smells, excitement, yeah? Emotions and feelings. Simplistic, I know. And then you have this thing at the back of the brain, about here, that is the uh, cerebral cortex. And everything that goes from one hemisphere to the other has to pass through the cerebral cortex. That's its function. Now, my simplistic idea of hypnosis is your conscious or your, your physical mind is, is, is in that frame, is that, is that simplistic, but your mind works in the same way, that you have part of your mind, which I arguably say is the conscious mind, and it is logical and rational and linear, and you have a part of your mind which is creative, and that's your subconscious mind. And there's this thing called the critical faculty, which seemingly is the bridge between the two, and you can do things that are uh, logical. So, for instance, if I were to say to somebody, pretend, put your hand out, put your hand out, pretend, just pretend, yeah, hold your hand out, hold your hand out, just pretend that there's a balloon attached to your hand, and when I click my fingers, it will lift your arm up. Just pretend it will, just pretend. Yeah, yeah, keep pretending. Keep, no, no, really pretend, lift it up, lift it up. Yeah, if, it's, if, if, if you're being pulled up and you're actually pretending and you're not pretending to pretend, your hand will come up in the air, won't it? Yeah, because you're pretending. Yeah? Now, thank you. Now, the reality is, he is logically doing that. He knows he's doing that. He knows his arm is lifting up in the air, and he knows his muscles are creating that lift. 
because his conscious mind is fully involved in that process and he's just lifting his arm in the air. His subconscious mind, which is actually the part that's really controlling the muscles, if you think about it that way, is playing because it does not have the capacity for logic. It's not its job. Yeah? In the same way that the right brain can't do the job of the left and the left can't do the job of the right, the conscious mind, its job is to be rational and to think and to argue and to create structured reasoning. And the subconscious mind ain't, doesn't give a monkeys about that stuff because it's not its job. It doesn't even know how to do it. It doesn't think along those lines. Its job is just to be fun and creative. And I know it's an old concept. If I said to all of you here, would you like to dress up, dress up and run down the road dancing? Logically, most, if not all of you, would go, no. Because logically, people would look at you. People would laugh. M maybe you don't feel comfortable doing that kind of thing. Maybe it's not who you think you are. But I guarantee there's a part of your unconscious mind, in fact, the unconscious mind, but because it can't see that rationally, because it doesn't have any concept of what people may or may not think in that sense, it would just go, what, dancing down the road? Yeah, of course that would be fun. Do, do you get what I'm saying here? Yeah? Very simplistically, this is how I look at it. When you show somebody magic and they're being rational and logical and they're watching it as a trick, they'll be rational and they'll look at it and go, oh yeah, that's clever. Don't know how it's done, but it's clever. When a person responds to magic by going, wow, there's nothing logical about that response, and it's not a conscious response. It's, it's, a, it's a, an emotional, unconscious response to the magic effect, yeah? As a magician, I create belief. I take people from being logical, rational adults through a process to being unconsciously competent at enjoying themselves, essentially. Yeah? Are you, are you with me on this so far? So therefore, is there, put your hand up who loves magic here. Somebody who's just a real lover of magic. Uh, picks, yeah, keep your hands up, because I need to... Ravi's going, me, pick me, pick me! Um, keep your hands up, because I need to have a look around quickly. I, I've got to randomly pick somebody. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping... Oh, yeah, you've all done something already, haven't you? Um, Tim, yeah, come, come down here for me. Uh, people, by the way, will spontaneously clap as he walks down. It'll be amazing. <laughs> Now, have a sit down, be with you in a second, Tim. Okay. You pointed this out, Jorgen, and I'm totally with you on this. One of the problems of these kinds of environments, and one of the things I've always tittered at quietly to myself whenever I've seen <coughs> hypnosis conventions and bits and pieces, is the reality is everything about today has been a bloody brilliant set piece, set up, suggestibility test, pre talk, hasn't it? Yeah? The whole day has been along those lines. So there is a sense where this isn't necessarily as real as it should be or could be. But Rav's seen me do this, and a number of the people that have seen me do this as well. I want you to understand what I'm talking about. Remember I said that magic can be something that takes you from a logical perspective to a, a, an unconsciously competent perspective, because you're now using your creative skills. Logic has gone out of the window, because in the frame of being a magician, he already knows that actually, yes, he can just bypass logic and, and enjoy magic. Does that make sense to you, yeah? It, it, if I say I'm a hypnotist, there's a framework of belief surrounded by that. If I say I'm a magician, there's a framework of belief about that. But if I can create a little framework where he can experience something that doesn't make sense, that is not rational, and he can have an emotional response to it, we have bypassed the critical faculty, and he's now in his subconscious mind. Just keep that in mind a second. Got any cards, mate? Massively prepared for this. Good man. Uh, give those a, a good shuffle. Or, or, or do it like that. What did I do then? Come on, guys, think. What, did I, what have I just done straight away? Yeah. Uh, no, no, but more importantly, what have I engaged? What did he do? Yeah, he laughed. Yeah? It doesn't matter what the emotional response is. An emotional response isn't logical. The reason for it might be logical, but the response itself is feeling. And feeling does not come from his left brain logical center, does it? 
It comes from his right brain, illogical, emotional, subconscious. Uh, oh, by the way, I wasn't going to mention this, but I will. I have a stamp. <laughs> oh, come on, I've got to share it with them. They said the head hacking thing. We've got to tell them. Only if you move the box on the OK, there you go. My friend Paul here and Suzanne, we have a stamp. And it's the C, where we go, TCBB. TCBB stamp, yeah? And it's the, this could be bollocks. All right? I want you to just think about that. Have a stamp. Please don't let this go. This is really important to me that you get this. Carry a stamp around with you in your mind. And every time somebody presents you with some theory, some idea, some, some discourse on hypnosis or, or, or the power of the mind, that you go, this could be bollocks. <laughs> yeah? Because there is a tendency for people not to do that. No offence to any deeply held beliefs, but I've gone and seen some incredible things done by people. You know, you know oh, if you stand on one foot and, and you hold your hand in the air and you drink a, 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 a pint of something, you'll feel this. And people go, oh, it's amazing. If you tap yourself in the right places, this amazing things will happen and the meridians will open up and energy will flow. The problem with is, it could be bollocks. <laughs> because it's just as easy for your mind to create all of that for you. It doesn't mean it's real. But at the same time, if it works with somebody and you're not deluding yourself about it, grand. Because I think that's important too. I mean, I love the idea of taking people out and doing things that are bigger, you know, because you're creating belief um, ultimately. And through belief, you get results. Um, no, no, this, uh, by the way, this is uh, just, just for you. Just say stop any way you like. Remember that card? You saw the card, yeah? Yeah. You could have chosen any card, I'm assuming. Try this, these are slightly sticky cards. With one hand, oh gosh, one card comes out, jumps through the air and lands. Your card was the uh, three of clubs, yes? No. no, hold that a minute. Was it the ace of diamonds? No. What was it? Uh, jack of diamonds. No, not my card. Okay, um, how would you feel if it changed while you were holding it? Uh, yeah, check it out, have a look. Sleep! Deeper, 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 all the way down. Deeper, 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 relaxing, floating, and sinking, and sleep. That's it. You can continue in this state, by the way, as I sit you up and go even deeper in your mind. And uh, every time I talk to the audience for a few moments, it just help you relax more and more. It'd be great. You'll love it. Right. What happens the moment he turns the card over? Sure. Yeah. It, it's a pattern interruption. It isn't logical. There's nothing rational about the fact that the card he knew was the three of clubs. He knew it. That was his left brain. All the information was there. It was logical, it was rational, it was linear. I'm holding the three of clubs. What would, what, what, what would, how would you feel if it changed while you were holding it? Now, all of a sudden, I'm asking him to engage a thought process that, that isn't rational or logical. How would I feel if it changed? Well, I thought that'd be really good. So we've already got him engaging his creative mind, but without doing it overtly so he can fight against it. There's nothing wrong with this yet. In the moment he turns it over, he has this crash of what his logic is telling him should be, which is, this is the three of clubs, and the sudden reality that it isn't. And in that moment, his conscious mind can't deal with this because it don't make any sense. What happens when the conscious mind can't deal with something? The subconscious goes, what can I do? <laughs> yes? <coughs> and I told him. Yeah? Just, 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 just nod to me if this kind of has a sense to you that you can understand where I'm coming from with this, yeah? Excellent stuff. Um, uh, staying deeply hypnotised, obviously, you can just open your eyes and sit up for me. Um, just hold the card up. What card? Did you, how do you feel when it changed? That must have been really odd for you. Yeah, it was very odd. Yeah, yeah, yeah just place it face down on the table for me. Um, look at me. Uh, you know the feeling you get when you wake up in the morning and you've had a dream? And the more you think about the dream, the further from your mind it goes. The more you try and remember the dream, the further from you like. Like a cloud bursting, a word on the tip of your tongue. You know how that feels, yeah? You're feeling it now, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Try and say the card, just find it's completely gone. Try and say the card, just no memory of it at all. Absolutely gone. The more you try and think about it, the further it will go. In fact, even if you were to turn the card over, you'd have absolutely no memory of it at all. Turn it over. Nothing at all. No recollection whatsoever. It makes no sense to you at all, does it? Isn't that bizarre? I tell you what, let's try something. Um, oh, excuse me. You'll enjoy this. Uh, hold your hand out for me. Uh, in fact, just say stop. Stop. 
place that back there. Notice as it went back in there, you've got no memory of that at all, have you? Not got a clue. Um, if I were to just riffle down the edge of the cards here, so you get a complete free choice wherever you like, would you just say stop for me somewhere, anywhere? Stop. Just there? Uh, pop it on the table for you. Uh, just let a card pop in your mind. What card are you thinking of? Five of clubs. Now, if that, well, you could have chosen any card, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Are you sure about that? Can you, by the way, can you see it? Nope. Not at all? No. Absolutely certain. Yeah, no. Definitely not there, is it? No. No, okay. You could have picked any card at all. Would you be happy with this? Yeah. I mean, no, no, no force of choice at all. No, at all. no? what card did you say? Okay, you can hang on there for a minute because you're doing very well indeed. Um, <laughs> oh, this is cool. Sorry, this is a weight thing. Um, can you see this yet? Yeah? Little to get it back in, it really is. Yeah, that's in there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah cool. Obviously, it weighs a bit more now, yeah? Um, these are good, actually, because uh, you know Amit Badiani is a great hit with this idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know kind of this idea that sometimes things that you have for a period of time come to have a resonance for you, maybe like a ring you've worn for years and years. You can kind of have a sense that it almost, it kind of possesses something. I'm not talking like wild spiritual stuff, but just kind of it has an essence almost. You can kind of imprint the yeah, feeling. Yeah, yeah. It becomes part of you. Yeah, yeah. Amit's had these cards for quite a while. You can tell they're a bit moth -eaten. But the weird thing about these particular cards is if, the, if you, if you if you get thrown them from a distance, because you kind of have to suddenly catch them, when you do that, you find your eyes close and you go into this kind of weird deep trance state again. I'll show you, watch, catch. <laughs> good man, good man, you're really enjoying this and that's fantastic to enjoy this lots and lots. So if you put your hand up here, you can just keep enjoying it, it'll be great, you'll love it. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to count to five and bring you up out of this kind of relaxed trance state. And, and when you come out of it, you'll just feel alive and refreshed. It'll just feel really good again. Um, but when you come out of it, you'll kind of realize and notice that uh, you've only just sat down here because nothing that's happened so far has actually happened. You've just arrived here, uh, sat down for the first time with, uh, with, with no memory whatsoever of anything else going on. In fact, you've just got here. But what you will notice is that this finger here, if you were to rub it with either of your hands, in fact, if you were to rub these little fingers together, as soon as you do, it would actually start to make you giggle. Look, if I rub them now, you start to giggle. And it gets funnier and funnier. The more I rub them, the funnier it gets. So that's a really good, funny feeling. Now, obviously, when, you get to the, when I get to the number five and you come out of hypnosis, you won't remember any of this taking place. But those little fingers will still work. You won't know why they work, but they will really powerfully. In fact, ten times as powerfully as they last worked. So coming out in five, opening your eyes on five, and realizing that you've only just sat down. One, two, three, four, five. Wide awake. How are you feeling, mate? Very good. Okay. Um, what, have you enjoyed yourself up to now? Yeah, it's been a pretty good day. Yeah. Uh, what's the last thing you've done, by the way? Uh, came down. Yeah. yeah okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I'm, 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 it's been a long day. I've got my own sense of confusion going on at the moment. It's fine. So you've just arrived here. Um, just let me ask you this. Um, don't do it yet, but if you were to rub the two fingers together like this, what would happen? Nothing at all. Hold your hands up. Rub your fingers together, see what happens. <laughs> Why is that doing that? I have no idea. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, when you come out this time, um, you still won't remember being hypnotised, but those happy fingers will work for you for the rest of the day. Anytime you fancy rubbing them together and making yourself laugh, you will do. In fact, you'll notice that any time I tap the glass on the table when you're sat back in your seat, that you'll rub those fingers together and it'll make you laugh. You won't know why it's happening each time. It'll make you laugh a few moments, and then you'll be a little bit embarrassed, but not too embarrassed. So when I tap the glass, rub your fingers together, and it'll feel great, and you'll laugh out loud. Uh, but with, uh, with that, on the count of five, coming up, going back to your seat, um, really, thank you very much for all of this. One, two, three, four, five. How are you feeling good? Yeah, uh, listen, I'm really sorry, mate. You're not quite the right person for this demonstration. Have a seat. I'll give you a clap anyway. <laughs> Okay, um, 
What I do want to do is take a step back slightly. <laughs> <laughs> Right, OK, sorry. Um, I want to talk uh, just for a few moments about the concept of confidence. Um, just to give myself a little plug, I've got a book coming out later on in the year which uh, essentially is about looking at the way that I've, I, I, I've come to, to, to magic and pickpocketing hypnosis, the, the journey that took me to where I am, and, and all the bits and pieces I've picked up. I've had the great honour and pleasure of meeting some phenomenal people. And I don't mean famous people, I mean phenomenal people. Um, I, I, when I worked as a nurse, I uh, met this chap who would, uh, he, he was in his late 90s when I knew him. He'd been a prisoner of war in a Japanese war camp. And uh, he'd come in for a, a minor operation, nothing, nothing major. I worked in, in surgery at the time, and we were doing uh, urology day cases at the time, sort of simple circumcisions and bits and pieces like that. He'd come in for a, uh, something called a cystoscopy. Um, and part of the process was that I was uh, the anaesthetics assistant. I would prepare the person with the anaesthetist and then I would look after them throughout the operation. And when we went to assess this guy, um, I asked him because of the kind of operation he needed to strip off to a certain degree. And uh, he did so. And what I saw just blew my mind. He had scars running the length of his body in parallel, in tram lines. Quite thick scars. Literally, down his legs, around his body, everywhere. And they'd cut him open with a surgical blade, a scalpel, just the top layer of skin. And then they stretched it. All right? It, it, utterly horrifying. But beyond anything that I'm even remotely able to, to contemplate in any sense whatsoever. The fact that he was there, smiling, was incredible in and of itself. What was more incredible was that the guy sitting next to him in the bed was the same age, in Japanese. And they got on like a house on fire. You have never seen, they were a pain in the ass, the two of them. They really were troublemakers. But it was incredible to see somebody who was able to, to have this sense, this, this, this way of being. <coughs> And I had the opportunity to ask him, just, just to get, I said to him, look, I, I don't want to be rude, I don't want to be, you know, irreverent in any sense to how you feel and what you've gone to, but can you just give me some, something that would help me to understand what it is that you do and how you do it? He says it's simple. He says, I realised that fear is something that you add, and if you can add it, you can take it away. That's all I did. He says, that's, that's what happened. I just started to remove the resistance to fear. And it got me thinking, and it sent me on a track and a train of thought. And the train of thought was this. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually quite a salient point, so just, if you don't mind, just for a second. Thank you. <laughs> Some of you have just completely changed the way you feel about me in that little moment, then, didn't you? I felt it. I could tell. It's fine. You're, you're good, aren't you? Yeah, put your hand up if you feel good. Put your hand up if you feel good. Yeah, as your hand comes down, you'll feel twice as good. Good, there you go. OK. Um, taking this idea of, of, of confidence, um, most people, and a lot of the way that confidence is taught, is it's taught as something that you gain. We, we're, we're instructed to gain confidence, yeah? We, we hear the idea of self-confidence, to attain self-confidence, something that needs to be got at, grasped, taken in. The metaphor being it's not there already. Yeah? Is this clear? Does it look relatively flawless? Does it look good? Yes, it does. Right, yeah, relatively. Would you admit that if you started to look at it very closely, if I just have a look at look closely, it's actually not clean, is it? No, no, it's not clean. But it looks clean, doesn't it? But it's, it now doesn't look as clean. No, no. Uh, and would you, would you agree that if you were to look at it really closely, John, really closely, you'd actually probably start to see more imperfections, yeah. wouldn't you? You, you would, wouldn't you? And in fact, if you put it under a microscope, you'd, you, you'd see a crack somewhere, wouldn't you? Inevitably, there'd be some crack. And you might have to really power down in 
to a microscopic level, but eventually you'd start to see gaps. And if you went really, really, really far in, those gaps, from a perception point of view alone, would look like they were getting bigger because you'd get closer to them, to the point where you'd only see the gap. And the problem with anything that is self, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-hypnosis, is that it gets you to look at yourself very closely. And as soon as you do that, you start to notice imperfections. And, there's no, and if that becomes something you fixate upon, you end up being, what's the word? It begins with a D. You end up depressed. If you start looking at yourself internally, if you meet anybody who has a depressive persona, if they suffer from depression, if the doctor's gone, mm, you know what your problem is, you're depressed. Oh, you bastard, you've just told me what I am. Thank you so much. Is that you've introverted your viewpoint. And I personally feel that one of the best things you can do is the opposite, is to, is to become externalised. And I started to think about this idea of confidence and self-confidence, something you attain. And I thought, hang on a minute, maybe if I, if I shift my perception and my focus, maybe if I start to look at the idea of confidence Maybe, maybe it's not something I gain, maybe I already have it, and maybe I'm, I'm causing myself problems. And if I think about it like that, actually that makes sense now, doesn't it? Because if I, if I create resistance to something, it limits my capability. Martial arts has been mentioned. I, 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 I'm, I did quite a lot of martial arts as a kid. I haven't for 10 years now, because I don't see any value in it, personally, for, for me anymore. Not value generally, but just for me. Somebody bigger than me, somebody blatantly physically stronger than me, please. Yeah? Blatantly physically stronger. Would you come down? I'm not going to do anything bad to you. Nothing nasty is going to happen. <laughs> it's like a running gag, isn't it? Let's just do it again for the fun of it. There we go. Steve, uh, grab hold of my arm. Yeah? Really tight. Tight as you can. Tight as you can. Now. You know where this is going, don't you? <laughs> Pretty good idea, anyway. Now, um, really hold on tight. Yeah. Now, if I try and fight against Steve, Steve is physically a lot stronger than I am. Yeah. Keep hold. Keep hold. However, if I just completely go loose and limp and relaxed, all of a sudden I've got a massive range of movement. It must be quite annoying for Steve not to be able to do a massive amount of bow. You know, it's that. Is that odd? Why, why, why should I be able to walk around like this? <laughs> He's stronger than I am. Surely this shouldn't work. But why does it? Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Everybody do this. Put your arm up. Make it go stiff and rigid by tensing all the muscles up. Tense all the muscles up. Now, without relaxing the muscles that you now have tensed, try and straighten your arm. It's nigh on impossible, isn't it? Why? Because your muscles resist movement. Your own muscles have become the resistance to your ability to move. Tension is now in the way. And I think it's, it applies across life. As soon as you have something that creates a tension, it limits your ability to move through it. Yes? And, and a lot of the techniques I use both as a magician and as, and as a pickpocket, particularly in pickpocketing, as Rav knows, and as a hypnotist now, is I think about things differently. I think about how I can take you on a journey and create belief and the tools that I can use. And I'm willing to lie and cheat and steal to create the illusion for you of something that happens that allows those left-brained individuals to become right-brained. Yeah? Who here has heard the phrase, oh, there are some people who can't be hypnotised? Keep your hands up who believes that's true. Thank you, I'm delighted that you did. But I hear a lot of therapists, I meet a lot of therapists and performers who have a belief that there is a percentage that can't be hypnotised. Well, that's a belief, isn't it? Yeah? Just, just, I know you teach this on the course, and we've had discussions about this, so I hope you don't mind. All of you who do any kind of set piece, any kind of test for subjects, 
whatever it is, element, uh, whatever it is that you do that tests, be really careful that you don't create a belief when it doesn't work. Because the majority of people that I meet that, were, <coughs> that have a belief that they can't be hypnotized went to a therapist or a performer, went on stage for Paul McKenna's show, and, uh, oh yeah, well, Paul asked me to put my hands together and they didn't stick, and I, and I had to get, go and sit down. And automatically, without Paul having to say anything to them, that person walks off stage, as soon as their hands come apart, they go, oh, that doesn't work. And they walk off and they have a belief system that says, I can't be hypnotized. Be really careful about that. Make sure that when somebody leaves you, you don't leave them with a suggestion. And it's great that you mentioned that and you did as well with this idea of people who are suggestible. We all are. Yeah? We've all trained from a very early age to be brilliant, absolutely phenomenally good at receiving suggestions. And there were some of us who were very honest about that and go, yes, I'm good at receiving suggestions you're somnambulists, for want of a better phrase. And there's also some of you out there who are also very good at accepting the suggestion that you're not good at accepting suggestions. But it's still just a belief, and therefore it's just another process that can be altered and changed. And I, and I use a, very, a variety of techniques. One of them I'd like to quickly um, uh, do for you now is uh, this lady here. Would you mind? Please. Yes, fantastic. Come down, people will clap once again. Have a sit down. Have a sit. Oh, my wife texted me. Um, do you have a phenomenal memory? Not phenomenal. Okay. Could you memorize those cards yourself really quickly? Yeah. All right, let's try it. <coughs> um, this is going to be an odd angle. I'm trying to let you guys see the cards as well as, as her, so I, I apologize for the weird positioning here. Uh, can you see these okay? Yeah. Uh, as I go through, just kind of be aware of any particular patterns or order that you can see, anything that sticks out to you in any way, shape, or form. Uh, you may have noticed back there, I think there was two kings near each other, uh, and there's a, a, a six and a jack. But anything else that's particularly sticking out as being in, in any sense obvious? There was a, one of the cards was signed. Oh, one of the cards was signed. Yeah, but, but yeah, I think Amit being a magician, you'll have. Okay, you'll have done that at some point. Uh, I'm going to leave those there, and obviously you're going to have to trust these kind of people that I don't piss about with the cards. They're not going to change the order, all right? all right? Can I get you to move back just maybe a couple of inches? That's fine. Uh, put your feet flat on the ground. <coughs> now, um, honest answer for me, please. Do you, are you one of these people that drops into hypnosis like there's no tomorrow or a little bit the other direction? Towards the other end of the direction, You kind of nearly said towards the other end of the scale then, didn't you? Yes. So you have, a, you have a, like a mental image of a of a scale of, of, of being hypnotizable. Yeah, that makes sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, mm, lovely. Um, before we do anything, I want to just do something really quickly just to see uh, a little bit about the way your, your, your work, your mind works. I hope you don't mind. Uh, you'll, you'll enjoy this. You'll get something out of this too. Uh, close your eyes. Uh, just imagine this hand here is like a volume control to your uh, to your logical mind, your, your, your conscious mind. Uh, now, obviously, there are times in our lives when it's right up here at full volume, volume 10, however you're picturing or hearing that in your mind now. Uh, and there are other times when it's down here at kind of, you know, like number one. Th th this is when you're like really in your most logical thoughts. Maybe you're doing something very, very academic, something that needs uh, a really focused, logical mindset, day-to-day -day activity maybe. Um, and this, this is kind of when you're really sort of like almost like floating away a bit. Uh, and, um, and obviously when it's down here, that's when you're asleep. You, 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 so those are the possibilities. Position it where it is now, by the way. Just stick it at the volume. Okay, kind of everyday, everyday stuff. Uh, this, obviously, uh, you've probably realized already, is your, your, your unconscious, your subconscious mind. Uh, this has times when it's right up here. This is kind of really obviously deep trance. This is creative stuff. Maybe when you're listening to music and you're completely lost in the moment, that time when you're lying on the beach and you're melting into the sand, that, that, that feeling that you get, you're just sort of absorbed inside yourself, yeah? And there are times when it's right down here. Obviously, it never turns off completely, but sometimes it's kind of really lovely and relaxed and deeply focused. Other times, it's kind of not too excited. Stick it where it is now. 
OK, what I want you to do is just, uh, just kind of have a, a, imagine turning the volume control down on your logical conscious mind. For maybe, I don't know if it's at six or seven now, but just take, turn it down to five maybe. And as you do that, just kind of imagine the volume in your, in your head going a little bit quieter and notice the change in feeling. Turn the volume up again a little bit and just see how that makes you feel uh, and then back down to where it was. That's, that's excellent. In fact, just a little bit more, just turn it down a fraction more. And a fraction more. And as you do this, you probably realize that that, that, that subconscious volume is kind of wanting to turn up as the other one goes down. So turn the other one down a little bit more. Just notice the way that the subconscious mind starts to in, involve itself more. Maybe you could turn that up to, uh, to seven or eight now as well. Uh, and, and turn your conscious mind down. And, and your subconscious mind just starts to come up a little bit higher. And notice that as each time you lower the volume here, this arm here will just naturally start to rise up, because obviously one part of your mind has to always be in focus. So now as the subconscious mind is just a little bit more in tune, turn it up a bit more and see how it feels to maybe move your subconscious mind up to seven, maybe. Go up to seven, see how that feels. And lower down your conscious mind again, a little bit more quieter. That's it, just let the voice quieten down in your mind. It goes further down further down. And as you're doing this, your subconscious mind, it wants to stay where it is. I don't know, it might want to come up a little bit higher. Whatever makes you feel good to allow it to happen now. That's it. In a moment when this hand does touch your leg, you can just allow your mind to switch off completely and relax and float and sink. That's it. Just allow that flickering to continue. And you could imagine maybe, see yourself on that, that scale of, of where you see yourself going into trance. Or just already, you've already noticed you've moved closer to the other end of that scale. Just moving along now, maybe going a bit further. That's it. Maybe allow the subconscious mind to just come a bit more and just play with it up here a little bit more and just see how that feels. That's it. And this hand can continue lowering down, lowering down. So you're ready now just to, uh, just to sleep and just completely go down inside your mind. That's it. And that hand staying up there now, just floating away all by itself. Now, obviously, if I were to tap you on the back of that hand, all that rigidity would just disappear. The hand would become limp and loose and drop down to your lap. And that could be the moment for you just to double the feeling of relaxation that you're experiencing now. And it might feel really good to do that. Now, in a moment, I'm going to invite you to open your eyes. And when you open your eyes, you can stay just feeling relaxed. You'll be aware of the people around you, but of course, it won't be important, because all you'll be thinking about is those cards. I'm going to give you the pack of cards, and, and one at a time, you're going to deal the cards into two piles, face down, one at a time. Nod your head if you understand. Excellent. I understand. No, no, you're fine. You, 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 I've asked you to open your eyes, yeah. so you're absolutely fine. Okay? Well, that process has allowed us to do one thing, and it's allowed us to get in tune with the part of your brain that, that is able to process visualizations. And you did that, clearly. You could see those things going on. You don't feel any different than other sense of relaxation. Your eyes are watering a little bit as well, which is, again, a good sign that you're kind of in tune a little bit more. Try not to think about this further than you absolutely have to, but just please, can somebody verify I've not done anything here? Yeah, you, you, genuinely, somebody you trust. He hasn't done Okay, that's fine. Take the cards for me. Hold on to them. Move yourself a little bit closer to the table. Not yet, because it's important that you, that you access the, that part of you again. Deal the cards into two distinct piles. Yeah? Don't go backwards and forwards necessarily unless you feel you have to. You can put a card down. You might want to do another one. Ultimately, however you feel you should be doing it, do it that way. Now, at the moment, instantly there, I can see that questioning, logical, left brain part of you again. All right, so it's really easy to deal with, really easy to deal with. Just take a deep breath. Okay? See yourself, like here, look at my hand. See yourself most relaxed. A time when you were most relaxed. Maybe, maybe some people can think about that time when you wake up in the morning, that first few moments of the day, when you kind of know you can open your eyes, but you really don't want to, because it's just nice to relax, yeah? And that sort of fluttery feeling. Yeah, you can feel that already, can't you? That's how you can feel that sensation. It's, it's like nicely uncomfortable, you know what I mean? Nicely uncomfortable. Yeah, you can feel that now, can't you? Yeah, just take yourself in and close your eyes and just relax. Maybe let that sensation of heat and warmth flow through you once again. Okay? And this time when you open your eyes, just start dealing the cards down. Listen to the sound of my voice. Concentrate on what I'm saying. I'm going to be giving you lots of information, all of which is just going to help your rational brain have something else to do. Now, you can understand that. Nod your head if you can understand what I've just said. 
OK, open your eyes, start dealing the cards down. Start dealing the cards down, quick as you can, one at a time, face down. OK, uh, where were you born? Keep, keep going, Bristol. keep going. Bristol, keep going as fast as you can, two piles. Um, okay. Any idea how, how much you weighed when you were born in Bristol? No, none at all. Okay, just keep dealing the cards down into two piles. As you're dealing them down, maybe you want to think about which pile like, you most feel responsive about. The, the, the pile that kind of means the most to you. Maybe neither pile means anything to you at all, but you can keep dealing it faster and faster and faster and faster. Okay, excellent stuff. As you're dealing them down, just be aware of, uh, of anything that you feel. Maybe you're thinking about your toes right now. I don't know. That's a lovely earring you've got, by the way. Where did you get it? Uh, I don't know. Okay, go. Faster and faster. Quick as you can. And while you're doing that, let me have a sip. <laughs> okay. Excellent. They're enjoying it too, which is nice. Right, as the last card goes down, take a deep breath and just relax and sleep. And just go inside yourself and just don't think about anything at all for just a moment. Just feel everything going a little bit in from the bottom. That's it. Just take a deep breath and just breathe and relax. Allow yourself to breathe. A stretch. Okay, just loosen up. You okay? Yeah. Right. Now, before we go any further, I'm going to do this as slowly as I can. Have a guess. Is that a joke? No, it's not. Oh, that's the one, yeah. It's not that one. Um, have a guess what colour that one is without looking. It's red. It's red. And mm, might be slightly trickier. What about this one? Noticed there was a different response that second time round. There was a more emotional response. And she got it right in a very kind of weirdly profound way. Now, what did, did you remember what you said for this one? I said that one's red. You said that one's red. Yeah. Different response to this one, wasn't there? She just went red. Arbitrary. Didn't care less. This one was a just going for it. Yeah? Turn it over, have a look. Now you got that one wrong, that was black. Notice how the one that she got correct had an emotional attachment to it. The one that got it wrong was arbitrary, left brain, yeah? Now, when you were doing the rest of these cards, what were you thinking? Anything? Nothing? Were you just in the moment going with your feelings? Um, I was mainly concentrating on you saying go faster, so I was thinking I'm walking. Yeah, so logically you were just being... Yeah. Yeah? But what about the choices you were making? Was there any conscious decision about which one? Or was it just more about kind of how you felt? It was just more about how you felt. Okay. Um, other thing is, uh, just out of a weird interest, are you the kind of person who's more interested in, in, in colours and stuff, or are you kind of more of a, a numbers girl? Colours, I would say. You're a colours girl, all right. Sometimes that makes a difference to the outcome. Final question. Do you believe that you were hypnotised? You said colours? Yeah? yeah? And you did this without thinking. So not logically based. Very impressive. <laughs> very, very impressive. <laughs> so how does that feel? sits there and looks over your shoulder and there's another part that actually can do creative things yeah and there are many times when you are able to just let go of logical rational stuff and there's lots of things that you do all the time that don't really kind of make sense fair yeah yeah that's what hypnosis is so if you want to enjoy hypnosis more just get on and enjoy it yeah? Stop thinking about it too much. Over an analysis of such a thing that stops you doing it, which is why you make a mistake here, you don't make a mistake there. 
Listen, guys, I think she's been fantastic. <laughs> The whole thing about being a professional opportunist is, 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 is summed up in a word that was coined by uh, a guy called Ian Rowland, which is the wrongless approach. I have a mentality that he calls the wrongless approach, modelled off what I do. And that is, if you go into a situation with an idea of success and failure, you already have the framework of failure with you. You're carrying it into the room. If I'm going to go and do something and I view it as it'll either work or it won't work, I am carrying both of those concepts in with me, which is kind of linked to what you're saying. I don't carry the failure concept with me. I don't view things as being right and wrong, success or failure. If somebody says to me, oh, well, that just means you're sat on the fence, my response is no. I'm in a completely different garden. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> <laughs>